Good morning. Can you rejoice with me that this world is not all there is? <laughs> that we are, in fact, living for something far greater than just material prosperity in a broken world? That, in fact, our God, the King of Kings, has called us to be light and salt while we wait for Jesus to come back? Well, this morning we're going to continue our study of 1 Thessalonians, and our passage is in chapter 2, beginning in verse 17, if you want to turn there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17, we'll read it together. And our passage is going to go all the way to verse 5 of chapter 3. 1 Thess 2.17, But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly, and with great desire to see you face to face, because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus that is coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in your faith that no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we were destined for this. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction just as it has come to pass and just as you know. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. Lord, this is your word, eternal, alive, powerful. Speak it to our hearts this morning, please, Lord. Give us eyes to see truth, ears to hear your voice, receptive hearts to not just receive what you said, but to act on it. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me ask you, what is the Great Commission? I mean, that is not a phrase that you'll find in your Bible, but if you've been around Christian groups enough, you've heard that phrase quite a bit, the Great Commission. So what is it? Making disciples of all nations, and where do we find that? Well, it's found in many places, but probably the classic verse is Matthew 28, verses 18, 19, and 20. Jesus said, go there, for, well, first of all, he said, all authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to do everything I've commanded you to do. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So, we're commissioned by Jesus, with the authority of Jesus, to go do this. So what is a commission? Well, I looked it up in the dictionary, and it said, a commission is a formal written mandate granting the power and authority to perform various acts and duties. So a commission is to give somebody a mission to do and then giving them the authority and the power to do it. So that's what we've been given. With the Great Commission, we, all Christians, every single one of us, has been given the mandate to go make disciples. And with a mandate comes the authority to accomplish that miss mission. Now, if you'll remember in your study of the four Gospels, you know that Jesus said he was going away. So I'm going to leave you guys, but I got a job for you to do. Now, please understand, I'm coming back, he said. When I come back, I want to find you doing the job that I gave you to do, which is the Great Commission, which is making disciples. Isn't it interesting in these two letters, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians? Two letters that are decidedly about making disciples, that one of the major themes that runs throughout both letters is the return of Christ. Isn't that an interesting correlation? What is he going to find you doing when he gets back? That's the question. 
Well, chances are he's going to find you doing whatever it is you've given your life to. If you've given your life to making your life on this earth more comfortable, more prosperous, more pleasurable, then chances are when Jesus comes back, that's what he's going to find you doing. And if you've decided to instead pour your energy into people, accomplishing the Great Commission, chances are that that's what he's going to find you doing when he comes back. The choice is yours. And we are called to invest our lives in making disciples. So what is a disciple? <clears throat> well, simply put, a disciple is someone who loves Jesus and then seeks to imitate him. That's a disciple. That's what the Greek word actually meant in Jesus' day, methetes. It means to find a rabbi, attach yourself to that rabbi, and then follow him around and imitate his life. That's a disciple. Pattern your life after his life. So at, throughout Jesus' entire ministry, as recorded in the four Gospels, Jesus was all about making disciples. Paul, throughout his entire Christian life, was all about making disciples. God calls us to be all about making disciples. So here in these two very powerful letters, First and Second Thessalonians, we have a manual, basically, on how to make disciples. I know it's couched in the genre of a letter, but it really is. God gave us these letters so we can see what disciple making looks like, looking at Paul's example, looking at his life, and he lays it all out for us in First and Second Thessalonians. And our passage this morning actually continues that training. So let's go back just real quickly. I'm just going to run through these as a review. Back in chapter 1, we saw that disciples are people whose lives have been changed. People who've been converted from darkness to light. And that change cannot be hidden from other people. So other people, when they see that change, they start to imitate you. And we saw that in the Thessalonians, that people around Macedonia were imitating them as they were imitating Paul and Christ and people in Jerusalem. We saw in chapter 1 that disciples are people who have turned from their idols to the living God. We saw in chapter 2 that disciples are people who use God's message, God's methods, and God's motives. We saw in chapter 2 that a disciple maker has a deep affection for the people that he's discipling or she's discipling. An affection like a nursing mother, like a loving father. Then last week we saw that godly disciples and godly disciple makers have the word of God in them and it's working in them. Look at verse 13 in chapter 2. We're going to be here for a second. Paul says, And we also thank God continually for this, that when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you received it as what it really was, not the word of man, but the word of God. What a powerful verse. So let me ask you, the, the Thessalonians received the word. How does a person get saved? I mean, if a person is unsaved, living in darkness, how do they go from being an unsaved person, living in darkness, to being a saved person? What do they have to do? Well, first of all, they have to hear the message from somebody. And then God gives them faith so that the words coming out of that disciple's mouth, they receive it not as the word of that disciple, but as the word of God, what it really is. And they become convinced that it's true. And then what? So, as an illustration, I've got a $5 bill here. And I'm just, you know, wondering... I would like to give it to somebody this morning. And I'm just wondering if there's anybody in the room here who would like a $5 bill. What would you have to do to make it your own? I mean, I've got a $5 bill. It's here for anybody who wants it. Thank you. Well, I've had a lot of people I've shared the gospel with just like that. I have a $5 bill here, and I'm just wondering if there's anybody who would like it. I don't bite. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> See, he heard my offer. 
The offer sounded good to him. Whatever I was offering seemed like it was profitable to him. It was worth having. But he had to do something in order to make it his own. He believed my offer. He thought it was a legit offer. But he actually had to receive the gift in order for it to be his. That's salvation. Right there, that's exactly what it is. You hear the gospel explained by another person. It meets with faith in your heart. You accept it not as the word of man, even though that's a human being talking to you, but you accept it as the word of God. You realize you're lost in your sin. You're on your way to hell. And this person is telling you about the solution, which is Jesus Christ who died in your place. And you decide to accept the gift by faith. That's all it takes. That's salvation right there. All you have to do is accept the gift. There's nothing you can do to earn it. You can't buy it. It's free. And when you get it, you become saved, born again, a new creation, then that word, the word of God, begins to work in you, as Paul said to the Thessalonians here in verse 17, or in 13 in chapter 2. Now, that working of the word in your heart isn't going to happen overnight. God is going to start molding you, changing your life, changing your heart, changing your mind. But it's a process. And what you should do as a baby Christian is find somebody to follow you up. Find somebody to disciple you. If you don't have someone discipling you right now as a young Christian, then you should find somebody to mentor you. This is exactly what Paul was dealing with in Thessalonica. He was frustrated. These baby Christians had come to new life. They were under a severe test of affliction, and he, couldn't get, he got run out of town, and he couldn't get back to them to help them. He knew that they should have somebody to disciple them, somebody to mentor them, and he couldn't get back to them. So in verse 17, he says, But since we were torn away from you, brothers, that means brethren, brothers and sisters, we were torn away from you for a short time, in person, not in heart. We endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face because we wanted to come to you. I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before the Lord Jesus is at his coming? Is it not you? You are our glory and joy. You're our pride and joy. And did you see Paul's heart here? He's wearing it on his sleeve. This is the heart of a disciple maker. If you're looking at this as a manual and how to be a disciple maker, here it is. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Literally, he's talking about these folks like they are his own children. I was torn away from you. His heart yearns to get back to him. So he says, I was torn basically out of your arms. The word there literally is the Greek word where we get the word orphan. I was orphaned from you. I was bereft of you. Now, why is Paul talking about these people like they're his children? Because they are. He and Silas and Timothy led them to the Lord. They are his spiritual babies. And he says, we endeavored all the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face because we wanted to get back to you. Why? Because we needed to disciple you. Because there's wolves, spiritual wolves in this world, and we couldn't leave you alone. But we got torn away from you, and so we missed you. And we yearned for you, and we eagerly longed to get back to you, and we tried again and again and again. Paul is absolutely passionate about these people. He's all in emotionally, all in. Now, as I'm talking about this, I want you thinking about your own life. Do you have somebody with whom you are all in, Christian, that you're working with, discipling, mentoring? These folks have captured his heart. That's the heart of a disciple maker. Disciple making is not just imparting information to somebody. It's sharing life with somebody. That's the church. We're all called to do it. It's basically friendship with a purpose. The purpose being to encourage each other to draw closer to God. But, Paul says, Satan hindered us from making it back to you. Again and again. That happened more than once. 
Now, don't get all weirded out about this. Satan hindered us from getting back to you. It's, it's not as though God had this plan for Paul to go back to Thessalonica, but Satan proved too strong for that plan to be accomplished. And, you know, God tried to get Paul back to Thessalonica. Paul tried, but Satan just won this one. No, no, not at all. There is no great big power struggle in heaven between God and Satan. Any power that Satan has, he got from God. The devil is God's devil, and he only has as much leash as God is willing to give him. Now, in this case, Paul made a plan to return to Thessalonica, and God allowed Satan to block that path. That's actually the word that's used here, hindered us. It's like a roadblock that you would throw up to keep a, a, a troops from marching down a road. So Satan blocked their plan, and it worked out perfectly. And you say, well, Matt, how do you know that? How do you know that it worked out perfectly? Because I know Romans 8, 28. And I know that God works all things together for the good of those who love him. All things. So this opposition from Satan worked out perfectly for Paul and for the baby believers in Thessalonica. And for this long, young disciple maker by the name of Timothy. God wanted Timothy to grow too and to be stretched. Uh, Timothy... We know he was a young man at this point. He was probably a teenager at this point. He was probably 17, 18, 19 years old. And Paul's sending him back to Thessalonica into the lion's den to strengthen this church. And Satan op Satan's opposition was already working. Paul knew what he was doing. Why did God tap Timothy to do that? Because Paul's working all things together for good. For Paul, for the Thessalonians, for Timothy. I find this to be a very helpful principle when it comes to Satan. While Satan might thwart your plans, he can never thwart God's plans. Satan wages war against believers. That's clear. It's clear in our lives. It's clear in Scripture. But Jesus has already won the war. We know the end result. The devil can't do anything that God doesn't allow him to do. I mean, Satan only exists because God allows him to exist. Now, why didn't God just destroy Satan in the garden when he tempted Eve and, and wrecked mankind? Why didn't he destroy Lucifer back in the, in, the, in, in the heavens when Lucifer rebelled? Why not just squish him and do away with all opposition? Well, because God wants to use him for our good and for his glory, God's glory. Spiritual warfare only exists because God allows it to exist. He wants us to grow and to mature and to be strong, and that happens in battle. God wants us to rely on him, not on ourselves, and that happens by being thrown into the battle. And so he throws Timothy into the battle. See, God's great concern for us is that we grow in faith, in our ability to trust him even when things are tough, especially when things are tough. And all of the evidence in Thessalonica was that these young disciples were doing that. They were growing, maturing in character and in faith. And Paul's overjoyed at that. So in verse 19, Paul continues to pour out his heart of affection for these young believers. He says, for what is our hope or our joy, crown of boasting before the Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? You are our glory and joy. You're our pride and joy. Now, that's another parenting reference. That's what we say about our kids. Maybe not to their face, but to other people. He's my pride and joy. She's my pride and joy. In other words, Paul says, Jesus is coming back. And when he does, he's going to be looking to see if I, if Paul, if I have been doing what he gave me to do. He's going to be checking to see if his servants are doing what he left his servants in charge of when he left, what he entrusted us with. So turn with me to Luke chapter 12. Jesus did a lot of teaching, told a lot of parables to this effect that he's coming back and he's, going to, and he's checking to see what his servants are doing when he gets back. And that we need to be ready when he comes back. That we need to be expectantly watching, eagerly waiting, and doing the work that he left us to do. His servants. So in Luke 12, 35, Jesus says, Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning 
and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from a wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom he finds awake when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table, and he will come and serve them. That's the messianic banquet. So at the messianic banquet, Jesus is going to be waiting tables. That's weird. Anyway, that's not what this is about. Let's keep going. Verse 38, if he comes in the second watch or the third, that means if he comes really late, it's already been 2,000 years, so we know he's coming at least in the third watch, right, maybe, and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if that master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. Verse 40, you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Peter said, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for everyone? And the Lord said, who then is faithful and, and wise manager whom his master will set over his household to give them their position of food at the proper time? Blessed is the servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. So Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19, Jesus is coming back and he wants to know if I've been faithfully doing what I'm supposed to be doing what he's entrusted me to do when he comes. And what has he entrusted me to do, Paul says? Make disciples. And you guys, you guys over there in Thessalonica, you are my proof that I'm not living my life in vain. You're my proof. Your faith, your love, your witness, your growth, your hope are proof that I am not laboring in vain. That I'm not just spinning my wheels. That when Jesus gets back here, he's going to commend me when he comes back. That's what he says. You are my, my, my crown of boasting before the Lord when he returns. It's like a little boy who goes fishing with his dad. And dad says, I'm going to go down here around the bend. You fish here. And dad comes back with an empty stringer. And little boy's standing there with three fish. And he's like, look, dad, look what I got. Those fish are his boast to his father, Paul says, you people in Thessalonica are my boast to God. Now, Jesus said, or Paul said again and again, I will boast only in the Lord and in his cross. Don't get confused here. That's exactly what he's talking about here with these Thessalonicans. These Thessalonicans were confronted with the cross, with the message of the cross, and they responded. And now the message of the cross is working in them. The Word of God is working in those believers, and Paul rejoices at that because he's rejoicing in the cross in these people's lives. And it makes him think of the return of Christ, and that makes him rejoice all the more, which is all the motivation for him to want to go back to Thessalonica and help these guys. So he says in verse 1 of chapter 3, oops, Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in your faith that no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are destined for this. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction, just as it has come to pass and just as you know. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. So Paul's team had to leave this group of baby believers in Thessalonica under severe affliction, severe persecution. And he's beside himself because he can't get back to them. He's been ripped away from them, orphaned from them. And he knows they're going through tough opposition. And he's burdened for them. And he's wondering, did the devil succeed in snatching away the seed before it could germinate? Like the parable of the sower that we looked at last week. Did, did, did it fail? Was my message in vain? Was my work there in vain? I need to find out. I think reading this, it's not too strong to say that Paul was actually in agony over the Thess Thessalonican church, being separated from these vulnerable brothers and sisters in the Lord. It's not just that he wants to see them again. He needs to see them again. He needs to know how they're doing. He needs to help them. It's like a mother who's been separated from her child, and she knows that child is suffering. 
This isn't a want. This is a need in Paul's life. Do you see what Paul's saying here? He's saying, he's saying, I can endure hardships. I can endure the beatings, the stonings, the deprivations, the shipwrecks, the whippings. I can endure all that stuff, but I cannot endure not knowing how you're doing. I need to know. Let me just say this about Paul here. I think it's very clear Paul needs these people. And he knows they need him. That's how the body of Christ works. Paul's not afraid to express this need. This is a very personal letter, both of these letters. I want you to hear this. Needing each other is not a sign of weakness. Steve, I don't know if we need to turn it up a little bit. I think some people are having a little hard time hearing with the fans on. Needing each other is not a sign of weakness. It just shows that you're functioning correctly in the body of Christ. And if you find that you can function pretty well as a Christian without the body of Christ, then there's something wrong with you. That's why I get so irritated with people who just can't seem to find the perfect church. So they just end up, you know, I'm just going to stay home, read my Bible with my family. I'm just going to take a walk in the woods and just me and Jesus. It'll just be us two. No, 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 no. We were made for the body. We need each other. It, when God made us new people, when we were born again, we were born again by the Spirit with a certain spiritual DNA in us. And, and part of that DNA is a mutual need for each other. Just as the mouth needs the hand and the hand needs the foot and the eye needs the ears, we need each other. We're a new creation, new heart, new mind. But God is transforming us slowly and he uses each other to do that. Now, just so, and especially for people at home, just let me clarify. I, these comments I'm making right now are not about this COVID crisis. This is unique. I absolutely trust people to make the right decisions for themselves and their families during this time whether to come to church or not. This is not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about here are people who become disillusioned with the church, young people. And I'm talking about college-aged young people who become disillusioned with the church and chuck the church and say, oh, I'm just going to read my Bible and be on my own. Please understand, you're chucking to the side of the road the bride of Christ. Don't do that to my bride. You'll have to answer to me. Do that to Christ's bride, you have to answer to him. You don't like the church, be the next generation that changes it. But you don't get the option of divorcing the church. We were made to be together. Well, Paul says here, since I couldn't come to you, I did the next best thing. I sent Timothy to you. He's our brother. He's my go for. He's my assistant. No, he didn't say that. He's not saying, I, I couldn't come, so I, I found this teenage boy and I sent him. Hopefully he doesn't die while he's there. No, 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 no. He says, he's my brother. Not only that, he's my co-worker. Is that what Paul said? No, he didn't say he's my co-worker. What did he say? He's God's co-worker. He's God's fellow workman. He wants them to honor the fact that Timothy came to them. I mean, Timothy had his limitations. We know that. Timothy was young. He was sickly. He had some kind of stomach ailment. He was timid. More than once in, in different letters, Paul, you know, encourages Timothy in his timidity. It's okay. It's okay. God uses us in our inadequacies. Listen to what Paul said about Timothy in Philippians. This is much later in both of their lives. Paul says this to the Philippian church. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I may be cheered by news of you for I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. Here's a disciple who was discipled by Paul. Timothy has the same heart for making disciples and the same heart for people that Paul had. Paul says, I have no one like him who will be genuinely, genuinely concerned for your welfare for they all seek their own interests, not those of Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth how as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how, is it, how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. 
So apparently Paul did this a lot with his team members. Uh, but I think Timothy's trip to Thessalonica was his first. The, 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 the letters to the Thessalonians were early letters, and, and I think this was the first mission that Timothy was going on. And Paul said, I'm willing to be left alone back in Athens. And you can read all about Paul's stay in Athens in Acts chapter 17. Man, I wish I had time um, to do it. We'd have a two-hour sermon. Please go read Acts 17 in conjunction to this this afternoon and see what Paul's visit in Athens was all about. Paul hadn't even planned to go there. He just went there because he had to send Timothy away, and so he went to Athens to sit and wait there until, until Timothy got back so that they could go on to Corinth. And while he was in Athens, some really cool things happened. We're not going to talk about it. All right, so when Timothy goes to Thessalonica, he basically has two goals in his mission. Paul says in verse 5 of chapter 3, I sent him to learn about your faith. Timothy's on a fact-finding mission. Paul wants to know how these guys are doing, and Timothy's supposed to find out and then report back to Paul. The other part of the mission is found in verse 2. Paul says, your mission is to establish, and his, his mission is to establish and exhort you in your faith. To establish and exhort you. Some versions say to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith. Timothy's goal, his mission, is to strengthen the church. And how's he supposed to do that? Encourage them and exhort them. Like a mother, like a father. Just as Paul was doing. Have you ever felt like you just need strength to go on? Okay, I doubt anybody in here is like that. I, I am, I'm probably the only one, right? That, <laughs> You just feel so tired, spiritually tired, you're worn out. What is it we need at that moment? We need strengthening. How does God meet that need? Does he just plop a bunch of sticky strength on us? And now you're strong? No. How does he, how does he meet our need for strength and encouragement and exhortation? He puts his hand on a brother or sister, and he brings them to us to do God's work in our lives. Disciple-making. Let me ask you, are you doing this for others? I'm wondering, if I passed out a half sheet of paper to everybody in the room, could you write down for me on a half sheet of paper how you are strengthening brothers and sisters in Christ in their relationship with Christ? What would you put on that piece of paper? Whose names would you mention? Now, I'm not trying to beat you up here. I just don't want you to go away from a sermon without actually going away with something to do. I mean, this sermon is not church. This, this is not where church happens. People say, we're having church online. I watch the sermon online. That's not church. No, 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 no. Just because you're not coming here to listen to the sermon, you're listening to it online, doesn't mean you can't be in the church. What is church? Church is us working together, helping each other, encouraging each other. The whole point of this sermon is simply to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Ephesians 2 says that the job of the elders is not to do the work of the ministry. The job of the pastors, if you like that word better, is not to do the work of ministry. Our job is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Your job is to do the work of ministry. It's mine too. I'm, I'm, it's not like I'm not part of the body. When we hear a sermon, we're supposed to do something about it. So I'm, I'm not trying to beat you up. I'm just trying to light a fire under let me put it that way. All right, back to the sermon. <laughs> there are people all around us in this church who need to be strengthened, need to be encouraged. What are you doing for them? Don't put it on the elders. Don't call me and say, Matt, this person over here needs help. I say, help them, disciple them. You say, well, Matt, they don't want to come to church. They're, 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 they're at home. Got a phone? Call them. Somebody on your heart that you don't see here at church? Call them. Go visit them. Have a picnic in a park. Take them lunch. Eat outside in the backyard. I don't know. Okay, so Paul says to the Thessalonians here in verse 3, chapter 3, that he's concerned about them lest they be moved by the persecutions and afflictions. And then he says at the end, look at this, verse 3, 
For you yourselves know that we were destined for this. When we were with you, we kept telling you that we were going to suffer affliction, and it's come to pass. Just as you know firsthand, because it happened to them. I don't know where it happened, somewhere along in church history, where we changed our presentation of the gospel and, and stopped telling people that to follow Jesus is a da dangerous thing. Where we stopped telling people that to follow Jesus means you're going to suffer for it. And started telling people that to follow Jesus means he's going to make you all happy and cozy and comfy and, and peaceful. No, that's a lie. Notice in verse 4. Paul, in his presentation of the gospel, was very careful not only to invite people to salvation in Jesus, but to tell them what you're proposing on doing. This decision you're about to make is a dangerous decision following Jesus. You're signing up for difficulty. You're signing up for affliction. If you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to be afflicted. Jesus said in Matthew 10, if you will follow me and do what I tell you to do, all men will hate you on account of me. Stop trying to get them to like you as you share the gospel. They're not. In John 16, Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation. He's talking to his disciples, people who follow and imitate him. In this world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I've overcome the world. Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, in fact, in verse 12, he says, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, you can finish it, will be persecuted. Jesus didn't come to make our lives on this earth more cushy or cozy or comfy or safe. Not at all. He came to seek and to save the lost. And then he gave us that job. He called us to turn this world upside down at great risk to ourselves. Where are you in that? And I know, I know, I keep harping on this in my sermons. I'm not going to apologize for that. One of the most tempting idols in modern Christianity is to imagine that God is the servant of our desires and our plans, our agendas. That he is there to meet our demands just the way that we would imagine he would do. That he is there to solve our crises in just the way that we would imagine him to do. That is the idol of self. It's the idol that says God exists to serve me rather than me being in total submission to his lordship, to the God who saved me so that I would serve him. That's an idol, the idol of self, that ignores every martyr who ever suffered and died for the faith. Why didn't God get them out of that crisis when they begged for it? Because they were following the pattern of somebody who had begged the father to get out of a crisis. And the father said, with his silence, no. When Jesus said, can you take this cup, father? With silence, the father said, no. Yes, God has called us to paradise. But that paradise cannot be found or forged on this earth. You can't do it. That comes in the next life. For now, we have a job to do. And Jesus compares, he often compares our life here in this world as disciples to working on a farm, working in the fields. It's a picture of, that Jesus paints throughout the Gospels. Repeatedly, he gives us this picture that we are co-workers with Christ, just like Timothy was earlier in this passage. And he says, your labor in the fields is actually a pretty cushy labor because the fields are white for harvest. This isn't a skimpy harvest. Just get busy and you're going to find souls. Just do it. The implication is that you're, you're, you're um, doing a great mistake with your life if you decide to try to make paradise for yourself here on this earth. You can't do it. Not in this broken world, you can't. So this morning, I'm calling you to consider what you're doing with your life. What are you living for? Only one life, it will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. That's a great poem. There's a lot to it. Go ahead and look it up this afternoon. Young people, 
Look it up this afternoon. Go home, Google it. You know the guy who wrote that was a professional athlete? A world famous professional athlete? Everybody worshiped this guy for his athleticism? And he walked away from it. He died on the mission field at the age of 70. But not until he had reached unreached people in India, in China, and in Africa. Oh, let my love with fervor burn, and from the world now let me turn, living for thee and thee alone, bringing thee pleasure on thy throne. Only one life twill soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. That's a risk. He died in Africa, in some bush station out in the middle of nowhere. Gullstones killed him. You know, Paul says a very interesting thing here in verse 1, chapter 3. Go ahead and read it again with me as I read it aloud. It says, therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens and send Timothy to you. We thought it best. I love that. See, Paul wasn't operating on some divinely revealed blueprint about when and where he should do something and what he should do. It's not like God just plopped this blueprint down in front of Paul and Paul's like, oh, okay, well, it says here, guys, we're supposed to go to Thessalonica. No, he didn't have that. Please beware of people who are always saying to you that, that God told them to do something. Well, God told me to do such and such, or God laid it on my heart to such and such. Yes, God does that sometimes. It's rare. That is not the way God normally does it. And I'm going to make my case to you here. See, what God has done for us in the bulk of the time that he's leading us is he's given you a brain, he's given you a spirit, he's given you his word, and he's given you a promise to give you wisdom whenever you ask him for it because you can't see into the future, so you need his wisdom. <clears throat> but then he gives us the privilege and the responsibility to make the decision on our own. Paul says, we thought it best that I go to Athens and wait and Timothy go to you. We thought it best. So I have another $5 bill here that's burning a hole in my pocket. And I'm just wondering if there's anybody here who might want a $5 bill. I don't know. Maybe the one who has one would like to double his money. I don't know. I've already proven I don't buy it. I'll pay you for not leaving me hanging. Thank you. <laughs> so here's my point with that $5 bill. I had one $5 bill left. It was my God-given God right to decide what I wanted to do with my $5 bill. What to do with it and how to spend it. In exactly the same way that you have one life to live, and it is your right and your responsibility to decide what you're going to do with it and how you're going to live it. How are you going to spend it? Are you going to spend it on yourself? Or are you going to invest it in the kingdom and into building up the body of Christ? Are you going to give it to the Lord in service? So, young people, I'm back to you. As you consider your future, young people, and you think about what you're going to be someday, what you're going to do someday with your life, what are you using as criteria for making that decision? What are you using to guide your decision in deciding what you're going to do with the rest of your life? Well, I can tell you from experience, there is no greater joy. If you're, if you're trying to find something that makes you happy, joyful, I can, from experience, tell you there is no greater joy than investing your life in loving God and helping people who need help. For some reason, we are never more satisfied than when we're doing what he created us to do, which are the works that he prepared in advance for us to do, which is making disciples. You're, you will never be more satisfied than that. I think young people today want to be invested in something bigger than themselves, more lasting than this life. What could be greater than the commission given by the King of Kings to go and do his bidding? by building a church all over this world. 
Now, I keep saying young people. I shouldn't do that. I'm talking to all of y'all. Moses was 80 years old when he finally got serious about serving God. All right. Paul says here, when we could bear it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens. And we sent Timothy to you. Paul and his team, they looked at the situation. They weighed their options. I'm sure they prayed about it. He doesn't say it here, but Paul prayed continually. So they, they, they prayed about it. And then they did what they thought was best. They took a chance. There was a risk there. Isn't it interesting? They didn't know how this decision would work out. They didn't know if Timothy would be arrested when he got back to Thessalon Thessalonica. It was a very real possibility. They had no idea whether Timothy would be stoned to death the minute he showed back up as one of Paul's associates. I want to make a point here. God doesn't want you to know the future. I'm going to say that again, give you time to write it down. God doesn't want you to know the future. He wants us to exercise faith. The development of our faith is of paramount importance in God's development of us. And Joel's going to talk a lot more about that next week. So I'm going to move on from there because he's going to do it. But what I do want to develop here, and I'm almost done, what I want to develop here is this, this thought of taking chances and risks in making decisions. Turn with me to James chapter 4. Evidently, God does want us to live in ignorance of the future, and he wants us to live in uncertainty about the outcome of our actions, the outcome of our decisions. I'm going to say that again. Evidently, God wants us to live in ignorance of the future, and he wants us to live in uncertainty of the outcome of the decisions that we make. He wants that from us. Evidently, James chapter 4, verse 13 says, God says through James, come now you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you don't even know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are just a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. You and I don't know what tomorrow holds. I don't know that I'll ever see this afternoon that my heart won't stop beating before I reach this afternoon. You don't know if you'll be here on this earth next Sunday. We have no guarantee about that. We do not know about tomorrow. And apparently God likes it that way. God obviously knows the future. In fact, it's not even future to him since he's outside of time. But he rarely lets us in on it. Why? He gave us a few things, you know. Yeah, you're saved, so you'll be in heaven. We know that about the future. I don't have a clue what heaven's like. And God's like, oh, that's the way I want it. No eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the mind of man imagined, the heart of man imagined what heaven's going to be like. So he tells us we're going to be there. He doesn't give us any details about it. He tells us I'm coming back. And then he says right away, but you don't know when. Nobody knows when. I don't want you to guess at when. I want you to be in ignorance about the future. Why? Because God wants us to trust him, and he wants us to trust that he holds our, his, our future in his hands. And that involves taking risks. You know, you can only take risks if you don't know the future. God can't take risks because he holds the future. But you and I, we take risks all the time. It's part and parcel of our lives here on earth. You can't avoid risk. It's everywhere. Just as we saw in James chapter 4. You have no idea when that meteorite's going to crush your house. <laughs> or whatever it is. We don't know. You have no idea. Now, people who don't want to take risks, they do so under the assumption that that risk would endanger their security or their safety. But James chapter 4 makes it clear that safety and security are a myth. They're an illusion. When your time's up, your time's up, son. Ain't nothing you can do about it. You're done. You're gone. Question is, what are you doing with your time between now and then? Between now and your departure or his arrival, whichever comes first. What are you doing with yourself? Do you know what the number one reason is that Christians don't tell other people about Jesus? Do you know what the number one reason is that Christians don't make disciples with other younger Christians? You know what the number one reason is 
that people don't go into, into missions? Do you know what the number one reason is that Christians don't get involved in risky ministries like um, ending human trafficking? Do you know what the number one reason is? It's the same reason for all of them. Fear. Fear of taking a risk. How many of you really wanted the $5 bill? And if it wasn't for the fear of taking the risk of getting up out of your seat in front of everybody, you would have done it. But you stayed in your seat because of fear. I'm wondering how many Christians have been coming to church for years, getting fed week after week, getting counseling, accepting help from others for years, and yet they've never stepped out of their own comfort zone to mentor or help a younger believer simply because of fear, fear of the unknown. Jesus calls us to be disciple makers. He calls us to risk ourselves for the building up of the kingdom and the building up of the body of Christ. You have one life to give to him. As John Piper says, don't waste it. Maybe you're saying, well, Matt, it's not fear that keeps me from doing this. I'm just wore out. I'm too tired. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 28, please. We'll finish with this. Matthew 28. Matthew 28, or Matthew 11, sorry, did I say 28? Matthew 11, verse 28. <laughs> sorry, you all went to the Great Commission, sorry. Matthew 11, verse 28. I think I can hold it that long. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. You go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Okay, I'm back in Matthew 28. Let's go to Matthew 11. Matthew 11, 28, Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Doesn't that sound good? You say, I don't want to make disciples. I'm too tired, Matt. Jesus, it's an invitation. It's also a command. It says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. But then look at verse 29. Here's his answer for your weariness. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in spirit, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. What is a yoke? This is a yoke. I put my head here. Jesus says he puts his head here, and he says, now pull with me, Matt. Pull with me, Jim. Pull with me, Kona. Pull with me, Alexis. You want rest? You want real, satisfying soul rest in this world? What is Jesus telling us to do? Pick up a burden. This is a burden. It's not light. You put this over your neck. That's not the only burden you got. Now it's attached to some load behind you that you're supposed to haul. That's tough duty, right? Jesus says, come to me. If you want rest, come to me, and I'll give you a burden. Actually, what I'll do is I will exchange. I'll make a trade with you. I will exchange your burdens in this world with my burden for this world. Pick up my, what's Jesus' burden for the world, for the church, that we would make disciples, that we would make disciples of all nations, that we would spread this message everywhere. Are you tired? Are you worn out? Jesus invites you to come and find rest. And that doesn't mean, you know, cranking back the lazy boy with a tall glass of iced tea. No. That means exchanging your burdens in this world, which are probably wrapped up in how am I going to feed myself and my kids and house my, and clothe my, right? And Jesus said, don't worry about that. Seek first my kingdom, my righteousness, and all that stuff will be given to you as well. Take my burden. I'll relieve you of that burden, that wearisome burden of chasing after the things of this world, and I will give you a different burden. You want rest, deep, soul-satisfying rest? Then be busy about what God has given you to do. In Luke 9, 23, Jesus said to them all, if anyone would come after me, that means if anyone would want to be my disciple, he must deny himself and take up his cross every day and follow me. Let's pray. 
God, once again, we find ourselves in your word insufficient for these things. We need you and we need each other. Father, we realize we need to be a team. More precisely, we need to be a body that works together. And we ask you to do that for us, Lord Jesus. And we pray it in your name. Amen.